Uh, if there's a silver lining in the dark fiscal cloud hanging over state governments, it is that massive budget shortfalls are prompting all sorts of debate about the way states run their business. Most notably, prison reform. Some states turning to privately run prisons build as cheaper alternatives. Little did they know that a new report just came out showing that private prisons can in fact be more expensive to run. But at the end of the day, private versus public when it comes to prisons is a false debate. The real question should be, why are we putting so many people in prison in the first place and why are so many of them nonviolent drug offenders? And why are so many of them minorities? Takes us to today's specialist, Michelle Alexander, an associate law professor and author of The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. And Michelle, we welcome you as our specialist. Do you have any answers to my questions? Well, we should absolutely be releasing people from prison rather than trying to warehouse them more cheaply. Over the last 30 years, our prison population has exploded, has quintupled, gone from around 300,000, 350,000 to well over 2 million for reasons that have stunningly little to do with crime or crime rates. Crime rates have fluctuated during this period, gone up, gone down, and today, as bad as crime is in many parts of the country, crime rates are at historical lows. But incarceration rates, especially black incarceration rates, have consistently Soared. Uh, most criminologists and sociologists today will acknowledge that crime rates and incarceration rates have moved independently of one another. Incarceration rates have soared regardless of whether crime was going up or down in any given community or the nation as a whole. So what does explain this prison boom? Well, the answer is the war on drugs and the get tough movement, the wave of punitiveness that washed over the United States. In fact, today there are more people in prisons and jails just for drug offenses than were incarcerated for all reasons in 1980. And the overwhelming majority of those swept up in this drug war have been poor folks of color, uh, arrested and convicted of primarily nonviolent, relatively minor drug offenses. And, and one thing I want to interject into this, because this struck me, was that it is no more likely that a young black man is in possession of marijuana than a young white man. People say, oh, well, it's because there's so many drugs in the ghetto and the black kids have all the pot, so that you, they're get wrong. Oh, the, the, the presence of possession of all races is more or less the same, and yet the incarceration rate, Karen, explicitly for minorities, is off the charts. What? Is this as simple, in your view, as the racism that it appears to be? Well, I think that's part of it. I think it's about racism and poverty. And actually, Professor, what I would love to get your thoughts on is it, it strikes me, I've worked with this population of kids, and, you know, 70% of inmates can't read or can barely read at a fourth grade level. So there's a direct correlation as well to education levels, truancy problems, and poverty issues. And, you know, it seems to me that efforts to reform our juvenile justice system and look at other approaches so we don't get kids into the system in the first place and actually educate yeah. them is one way to break the cycle. Well, it's absolutely true that in poor communities of color, our education system is failing. But if we want to stop locking up poor kids of color for minor drug offenses, then we should stop arresting them in mass. If you live in a white suburb or, you know, are on a college campus or a university, the odds of you being stopped, frisked, thrown to the pavement in search for a small amount of drugs are slim to none. But in poor communities of color, that happens as a matter of routine. And once you you've been arrested and branded a criminal or felon, even if all you're caught with is a small amount of marijuana, you are ushered into a permanent second class status yeah. for life. Yeah. You may be so, denied the right to vote, yeah. automatically excluded I guess the question juries. is how do we explain, as I ask to both of you and I'll ask you, Professor, obviously we have the budget crisis, obviously there's some injustice and some, uh, some uh, real debate here. How do we exploit the budget crisis to force a real reform debate when it comes to something like prison? Or is that wishful thinking on some like my, my, my part, Jimmy. You know what Congress has done on prison reform? Um, Senator Jim Webb from Virginia introduced a bill. It passes in a Judiciary Committee, and you know what it does? It hasn't passed the House, by the way. Um, it would establish a blue ribbon panel to study prison reform. That's what Congress has done on prison reform. <laughs> you know, professor, a committee to study the committee. <laughs> professor, I have a question for you. You know what? I've run the clock out, James. Uh, then I don't have a question for you. 
Professor, I'm going to give uh, your email to Jimmy. He's going to email you a question for later. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> uh, Michelle Alexander, the book is The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. This is an issue we will be staying with uh, for as long as it is an issue, uh, which I am You're fearful welcome. it will be for some time. It is wonderful to see the three of you. I've missed you guys. We missed you, yeah. Dylan. Did you miss me? We did. <laughs> you were great right on Bill Maher. Well, you guys, you guys didn't make me anything. There was no welcome back, Dylan. No, nothing. I watched you on Bill Maher. Oh, you what did. What more could I possibly do? Oh, that was pretty good, actually. He baked you something. Yeah. He didn't you share did. with us, oh, yeah. but he baked That's for you. That's what you did. You baked for me and watched on Bill Maher. <laughs> you, Thank I, you. I, you knew we were going to have to Could you make me gayer? Jesus Christ. Well, you're welcome. You can afford it. All right. We'll see these three on Thursday, and we'll have a wonderful afternoon. You guys enjoy the summer. Air uh, and, and coming up, you know, listen. It's one. It's my way to psych myself into the humidity. Uh, coming up.